Hey, if you have a Bible, um, turn to Luke chapter 23 as we're continuing to forge our way through the Gospel of Luke and planning to be done by the end of the month here. Um, really have enjoyed this Gospel and what, what the Lord is speaking to us through the life of Jesus. So we are in Luke chapter 23, if you would go ahead and turn there in your Bible. And then I'm going to just pray for our time in Scripture and then we will get started together. Father, now as we open the Word, having had the opportunity to worship in spirit, I pray that now we can worship You in truth, that as Your Word goes out, as it's read, thought through, and processed, that You would just really sink these things into our hearts, especially as it concerns the crucified Jesus, that we would see Jesus, Your life, and Your death in, in ways that perhaps we hadn't thought of in a long time. And I pray that our souls would be refreshed by Your sacrificial life and death, and that we would receive from you now what it is you've intended for us in the scriptures this morning. In Jesus' name, everybody said it, amen, amen. Well, this story, or this part of the story of the earthly life of Jesus is what we would call the crux of the matter. This is the, basically the center of Christianity, and that is the story of the day that Jesus died. The crucifixion of Jesus, the cross of Jesus, is central to Christianity. Without the cross, there is no Christianity. And the cross, the death, sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, is so important because of what it has accomplished. That's why we would call this the very center of Christianity. At the center of what we believe is a crucified, risen Lord. And the Part of the reason that Christianity is so, uh, or the crucifixion is so important to Christianity, is the fact that because of the crucifixion, death and sin have been defeated. Because of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, uh, the separation that was between man and God has now been taken away. And the wrath of God, the anger of God, the righteous indignation of God has been satisfied. So when you think about Christianity, you think about why we talk about the crucified Jesus so much, remember that this is the reason that we are whom we are today. If Jesus was just a great religious guru that died like every other religious leader in history, then, we wouldn't, then Christianity wouldn't be as it is. The reason that Christianity is as it is is because of the story that we're about to encounter this morning. But I, but I want to encounter the story the way that the gospel writer wrote it. Luke has a particular way in which he views this story. And in Luke's narrative of the story, what he does is highlights the different reactions that people have to the crucified Jesus. I actually counted in Luke chapter 23, in the section we're going to go through this morning, 10 separate reactions that people have had in just... Luke 23, to the crucified Jesus. It's a fascinating study in human behavior. If you, if you have the gumption to do so, I would actually encourage you to go back over Luke 23, maybe this week as you're preparing for burial and resurrection next week, that you would center yourself in maybe the reactions of the 10 groups of people in Luke 23 and how they reacted to crucified Jesus. It's a fascinating study into the human plight, into human behavior. And uh, it, it's actually interesting to think about how humans react, little human reactors that we are. And, uh, you know, psychology has actually come up with a name for a phenomenon that they've observed in people and how they react to times when they feel threatened. Any, any time that your well-being is threatened, that there's, a, there's a reaction that psychology is commonly called fight, flight, or freeze response right so so in any given scenario whenever there, there's some threatening threaten you're threatened in your well-being you respond in one of these three ways fight flight or freeze up and uh, the the article I read on this phenomenon that many of us are familiar with actually talked about two different scenarios in which your your instincts would kick in and you would respond in one of these three ways fight flight or freeze um, the first scenario was, so you're at work in a staff meeting with everyone that's in that part of your company in the department that you work for. And, and during the staff meeting, your boss singles you out and berates you 
for a project that you were on that you didn't get done in a timely fashion, but you know it was because of a lot of other people. But in front of everyone else, you are singled out and humiliated and everyone's staring at you. And at that moment, you know, the, psych, the physiological reaction, your blood pressure goes up, your heart is beating, and your, your reaction is to want to yell at your boss, to fight, because you've been unjustly accused and, and your well-being is being threatened. Your reputation is on the line. So your instinct would be to fight, to yell at your boss, but you withhold it and you keep your job and everything goes on. And maybe that's Monday morning for most of you. Um, the other scenario is, uh, that was used in the article was you walk into your you know, college classroom. And when you walk in, you're a little bit late and you realize that everybody's putting their books away under their desks, um, preparing for a test that you didn't know was coming. So not only are you not expecting the test, but you haven't studied for the test. And suddenly, like, you know, your palms get sweaty, you get that, like, sick, nauseous feeling inside. For those of you who have test anxiety like I do, I hate tests. Um, and just that feeling, and your instinct would be what? Run out of the classroom before the professor sees me, right? Flight. And, and that said, any time our sense of well-being in any way, shape, or form is threatened, we have some natural inclination, some responses, whether it's hearing the growl of a grizzly bear or a snarky remark from you know, a co-worker, we have sort of an, an inclination of how are we going to respond to that life, that, that threatening to our well-being. Well, in Luke's narrative of the crucifixion story, he highlights the way individuals are going to respond to the crucified Jesus, and I think it's very fascinating. Um, so let's look at reaction number one, which comes from Pilate. His reaction is the first one, avoiding Jesus. Chapter 23, verse 1. Then the whole assembly rose and led him off, that is Jesus, to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Messiah, a king. Now notice, they've accused Jesus of political, economic, and spiritual charges. The religious leaders' anger towards Jesus is only because what they called blasphemy. He, being a man, has called himself God. But they know that that's not going to really get Jesus crucified in the, Rome, in the Roman uh, government, so they have to level other charges. So they say Jesus is not only a political uh, riotous person, but he is also uh, affecting the economy. He's telling us not to pay taxes. So Pilate asks Jesus, verse 3, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus' response, you have said so. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. Now, that's important to note when you think about Pilate. Th this phrase, I find no basis for a charge against this man. He's innocent. But they insisted. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. Now, this is pivotal. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction... He sent him away to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. So, so Pilate, we see, first of all, he's avoiding Jesus. He's trying to get out of it. At this point in Jesus' story, he has been arrested in the garden, interrogated by the religious leaders, and they have found him guilty on charges of blasphemy. That is, he's claiming to be God. Therefore, they want the death penalty for Jesus. But if you know anything about this time in history, the Jews did not have the legal right to uh, execute their criminals. They, they could not exercise capital punishment. When the Romans began their occupation of Israel, the Jews lost their right to exercise capital punishment. So if there was a Jewish criminal that you wanted executed, you would have to go before the Roman governor or overseer of that province that you were living in. And that happened to be, for these Jews, Pontius Pilate. So they take Jesus to Pilate in order to get him crucified, to, to find the death penalty exercised. But Pontius Pilate, after interrogating Jesus, can find 
no fault worthy of capital offense. That is, he's like, there's no reason to crucify him. And in verse 5, he finally finds his loophole. Look again at verse 5. Pilate's trying to avoid Jesus, avoid making a decision. And, and they, they make this one flaw in their statement. He stirs up the people over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee. And at that, Pilate says, oh, there's my loophole. Did you say he's from Galilee or this uprising started in Galilee? Because in the Roman Empire, a criminal was to be tried in the province that they either were from or where their crime began. And that was Herod's jurisdiction. And so to Herod Antipas, Jesus would go. Now, Pilate is obviously trying to avoid making a decision. If he was not being showing forth cowardice, he would have just said the man is innocent, case dismissed. But because of the infuriation of the Jews, Pilate is looking to not have to make a decision about Jesus Christ. So he sends him off to Herod. He's avoiding the inevitable. But how many of you know that you can't avoid the Jesus question? Everybody is going to have to answer the Jesus question. Pilate is trying to avoid it. So for a while he's able to get rid of Jesus, so he thinks. He sends him off to Herod. But Jesus, as we're going to see, will be back. And eventually Pilate will be forced to make a decision about Jesus. There are lots of people living today that haven't answered the Jesus question. Who is Jesus and what does his life mean for your life? But people want to put it off because they're not diametrically opposed to Jesus, but they're not for Jesus. They're just undecided. And so therefore, they, they, they preoccupy themselves with diversions. They pour themselves into their vocation. They pour themselves into hobbies or building houses or starting families and doing everything they can to be mind-numbed so they don't have to answer the Jesus question. But let me tell you, he won't go away. Jesus demands an answer. What will you make of this man, Jesus? Who is he? Is he a blasphemer? And is he someone to be dismissed? Or is he God and, and is he coming back and meant to be worshipped and will all men finally give an account to him. Who is Jesus? And that is a question for all time. It's the question of the universe. There isn't a more important question than the Jesus question, and you cannot avoid it. Pilate tried, but Jesus came back, and eventually, Pilate, continuing to say, I find no fault in this man, was forced into a cowardly decision, and he gave the Jews what they wanted. He conceded to the request, okay, then the Son of God will be crucified at the hands of a cowardly governor who knew the right thing to do but did not have the gumption to do so because he cared more about politics and pleasing people than he did about being decisive, but your indecision is a decision in and of itself. You know, you can't be indecisive forever. You know, I talk to people sometimes about Christianity or religion, Jesus in particular, and a lot of times people will tell me things like, well, I still have a lot of questions. And I will tell them, I've told frequently, I've told skeptics this, I said, you're only going to be able to play that card for so long. You cannot continue to be like just claiming you haven't figured it out yet, you still have more questions. There is a, a period of time perhaps wherein, yes, God will allow you to, to find and, and search, but there is a point he'll say you have enough information now. You can't remain undecided forever. Jesus will come back to you. And Jesus said earlier on in Luke's gospel, whoever is not with me is against me. Someone might say, well, like I, I'm not against Jesus and I'm not for him. Well, eventually, that mentality is going to turn into you're against Jesus. So Pontius Pilate is an example of a person who has the concerns of crucified Jesus is trying to avoid him, but that cannot go on forever. You can only ride the fence for so long. So let me ask someone in here who perhaps is like Pontius Pilate, undecided as it concerns Jesus. What are you waiting for? And how long do you think he's going to let you wait? And, and I'm not saying he's not going to give you some time. I fully believe that the mind and heart do need to be aligned somewhat. 
that, that, that people can't just step into Christianity with blind faith. But I'm also saying to you, there is going to come a time where that excuse won't fly. You don't get to be a skeptic and an, an atheist or an agnostic, probably more likely for some, forever. You only get to claim ignorance for so long. Pontius Pilate tried to avoid it, but eventually he had to make a decision. So that's reaction number one, avoiding Jesus. Reaction number two is a fascinating reaction, and that's the reaction of Herod. And his reaction is curiosity about Jesus. He's curious about Jesus. Take a look at Herod's response. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased, because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. For what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. He plied with him many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. Think about verse 9 for just a second. How haunting is the silence of God? In other words, it's almost as if to say, Herod, I'm not going to deal with you anymore. You've made your decision. He's trying to talk to Jesus, but Jesus won't respond to him. Just a haunting silence to think that God would ever stop communicating. The Bible says that God's patience won't last forever. That God will not always endure or bear put up with mankind. And so Herod gets the silent treatment with, from Jesus. And so his curiosity turns to blasphemy or to to mockery, the chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. Then Herod, verse 11, and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked Jesus, dressing him in an elegant robe. They sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. Interesting the friendship that was forged between Herod and Pilate around the person of Jesus. Neither man knew what to do with Jesus. Now, this Herod is a fascinating figure in Scripture. He's part of the family of Herods. There was Herod the Great, then this is Herod, the Ant Herod Antipas, and there will come another Herod uh, in, in the, the New Testament. But this Herod, Herod Antipas, is the one who was responsible for beheading John the Baptist. And he's a very enigmatic, odd, peculiar fellow, as a lot of leaders in those kinds of positions are. Herod was an odd man. And, and when Jesus came to him, his curiosity was piqued. He was glad to see Jesus. But not in the kind of gladness that you and I would describe as a good thing, but rather it was a peculiar curiosity. See, he had heard about Jesus, and he'd heard how many signs and miracles and things he had done, and he was like, great, a divine magic show. This is going to be awesome. I've been wanting to meet you. Now perform a sign. Do a trick. And when Jesus was silent, Herod went from curious to blasphemous to mocking. Because he looked at God, he looked at Jesus. His view of Jesus was, I just, I want to see him do something cool. I'm coming to him for a magic show. And I think it's maybe important to point out as it concerns the Herod mentality, that I think within the church, there can be in some circles an inclination towards curiosity about God because of the things he's capable of doing. Kind of being caught up with signs and wonders. Like miracles and prophecies and dreams and gold dust and, and, and gold fillings in people's teeth and barking like dogs and rolling around on the ground and being slain in the spirit and cackling like a chicken and all the sorts of things that can happen within groups of people that are really caught up in signs and wonders. And believe me, I've been in church for a long time and, and I went to a church where signs and wonders were a major portion of what that church was uh, uh, chasing after as a child. I remember being a kid and not understanding the tongues that were being spoken or the, the, the angry prophet that was standing up or the people that were falling down in front all over the church and people were telling me, oh, he's slain in the spirit, brother. And, and then from there, I mean, I've observed so many things. I've seen people vomiting in the spirit they so called it dry heaving in the spirit and I thought so do we just get to make up whatever we want and blame God for it but there is a place I think where where, where a Christian can come and they become overly fascinated with the supernatural it's a Herod mentality do you really are you ready to worship and submit to God or do you just want to see cool 
signs and wonders, have these prophetic dreams. And I'm not saying that there isn't a place for prophecy and tongues and interpretation and miracles, but certainly not in the way that a Herod pursues those things. When God is moving mightily in his church, the purpose is for gospel proclamation or for the protection and continuation of the work of those whom he is following or who are following him. And that, and that is, I think, sometimes we think that, that Christians should follow signs and wonders, but the Bible says, these signs and wonders shall follow those that believe. In other words, as you go out to do kingdom work and gospel work, it may be necessary for a gospel demonstration. And so something from heaven, something invading from the natural or from the supernatural into the natural may be appropriate, a miracle, a sign, a wonder, a prophetic word, all of that, but not just so a bunch of Christians can come around and be entertained. And several years ago, I, I, I went to a church with a friend of mine who was being kind of caught up in the charismania movement. And I loved this man dearly. He was, a, he was an important part of the church I was starting in. I, I, he was a very gifted brother um, who had come out of a lot of things and had a lot to give. But he got excited, Herod Antipas style, with signs and wonders. And it started to lead him down a really dark road. And I, tra- I was willing to travel as a friend down that road with him. And I remember we went to one of his, the services of this new church he started attending because we weren't like spiritual enough for him. Like we didn't have enough going on. Like I would just stand up there and preach and he was like, ah, come on. Where's the cool stuff? Where's the show? So I went with him to the service. I remember it was a sad and haunting moment as the, the, the congregation began to break out in what they were calling at that, that time the holy laughter movement. I'd never seen it before. And, and just people all over the sanctuary just busting up laughing, people claiming they were drunk in the spirit, falling all over the place and laughing. And it was like, it was like a frat party. And, and, and I thought, oh God, like, like where is this in Scripture and, and what is the point of this? Like there's no gospel proclamation here. This is just so a bunch of people can act out. And, and, and you know what happens if you're someone who pursues signs and wonders and isn't having signs and wonders follow you is that it's, you're always going to have to top that. So, so the barfing in the spirit and the falling over, that's not cool anymore. So we have to create some other thing, right? And, until finally, when does it stop? When do you finally say, okay, God, I, you've given us your word and there's a lot of amazing things in scripture, I mean, 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 talk about prophetic words, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, miracles. I mean, all that is in the scriptures. But we need to be careful that, that in our interest to see God do something, that that doesn't become the, the, like the Herod Antipas mentality. I'm curious. Because a lot of people will come around just curious. I just want to see a magic show. I got Ouija boards are fun and then church is fun because sometimes they do magic shows there as well. And starting to play with spirits. And Herod learned, I think, a a painful lesson. God just wasn't going to respond to him. Jesus would heal people when he saw fit. You have to trust in the sovereignty of God as it concerns the miraculous. To know that God is in charge. So Herod is curious. Pilate is avoiding. But unlike Pilate and Herod, there's this group of religious leaders that aren't riding the fence. They have completely decided their reaction to Jesus. And their reaction is the religious leader's reaction. Reaction number three is hatred. This is, this is the way the religious leaders deal with Jesus. Not like Herod, not like Pilate. Verse 13, Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, you bring me this man as one who is inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for charges against him. Again, For the second time, Pontius Pilate says, there's nothing wrong with it. I've examined him. I find no fault in him. And neither, verse 15, has Herod. He sent him back to me. So Jesus is now like that game of hot potato. They're just passing him around. We don't know what to do with him. Give him off to the next guy. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Verse 16, therefore I will punish him and then release him. That is, he was going to experience the scourging. Now, at this point, how many of you have a verse 17 in your Bible? Okay. So let me just, real quick, I don't have a lot of time, to explain something. Um, When the Bible is translated, there are different manuscripts that the Bible is, original manuscripts the Bible is translated from. The NIV, which we read, the ESV, which a lot of you read, um, do not include verse 17. 
And if you have footnotes, it explains it a little bit more. Um, but verse 17 is, is included in the King James manuscript or the way they translate it. Verse 17 basically says in the King James, for of necessity he must release one unto them at the feast. Now, this verse is recorded in both Matthew and Mark's gospel, something similar, but in the manuscript that the NIV was translated from, they don't include it. So that's why you don't have verse 17. Does that make sense? If not, we can talk later, um, but we don't have time for that. Okay, the whole crowd shouted, verse 18, away with this man, release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time, he spoke to them. Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for, penalty, for a death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then be released. The third time, Pilate says, I don't find any fault in this man. It's not worthy of death. But with loud voices, verse 23, they insistently demanded that he be crucified and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate finally caves. Pilate decided to grant their demand. A cowardly mistake he would live with the rest of his life. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. The religious leaders hate Jesus and want him dead. And they would prefer to have Barabbas, a known insurrection leader and murderer, than Jesus Christ. Now it's interesting because Barabbas' name coincidentally means son of Abba. And he's a murderer. He takes life. And the religious leader said, we would rather have the son of Abba, Barabbas, who takes life, rather than the actual son of Abba, God, who doesn't take life but has come to give his life. They chose a murderer over the Savior. They chose Barabbas over Jesus. Now Barabbas at this time, was their, he was their chief criminal. He was the insurrectionist leading a, a group of dangerous uh, insurrectionists. He was a murderer. He was a part of a group called the Dagger Bearers. And he was a fierce known criminal that was trying to overthrow the Roman government. He was the Romans' chief criminal and he was the one released while Jesus was taken now what I find fascinating is as Barabbas is sitting on death row he was the one to be crucified on the middle cross in the middle cross that good Friday but then enter Jesus into the equation a surprise added element in the story and Barabbas is set free and Jesus is apprehended and if you would Jesus dies on the cross meant for Barabbas the wood that Jesus hung on was Barabbas's wood it probably had his name and his crimes ready to be nailed to it but on that day Barabbas is set free and Jesus is crucified and the more I look at the Barabbas story, the more I have this conclusion, the one that I believe Martin Luther made. I am Barabbas. I was supposed to be the one to die, to pay for sin. I was the criminal. I was the chief of sinners. And Jesus has taken my cross. And so the religious leaders hate Jesus. Pilate avoids Jesus. Herod is curious about Jesus. But then there's this interesting group of people, the ones that follow Jesus. Verse 26. As the soldiers led him away to be crucified, they seized Simon of Cyrene, who was on the way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, interesting thing. I mean, imagine Jesus has been scourged beaten and so he's in a weakened condition been up all night in a trial he turns to these women who are mourning over his condition and says daughters of jerusalem do not weep for me weep for yourselves and for your children for the time will come when you will say blessed are the childless women the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed then they will say to the mountains fall on us and on the hills cover us 
For if people, now, now catch this proverbial statement, verse 31, for if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Now this statement is probably saying, as they're observing Jesus being taken away to be crucified, he's saying, if this is what they're going to do, if this is what is going to happen to an innocent man, referring to himself, that is doing this when the tree is green, then what's going to happen to the guilty Jews? What will the Romans do to the guilty Jews? So this third group or this fourth group, their reaction, the followers of, uh, of Jesus are sentimental. They're sentimental about Jesus. You know people like this? They're not necessarily worshipers, but they're very sentimental about Jesus. They, 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 they have affection for Jesus. And Jesus then confronts the sentimental followers, these weeping women of Jerusalem, and says to them, do not weep for me, weep for yourselves. Dark days are coming for you. Days that are so dark that it would be good for you if you'd never had children, women. It'd be good to be barren. Why? Because obviously in that culture, being barren seemed like a curse. But in the days that were coming, referring to the Roman invasion in AD 70, when Jerusalem would be sacked, the city destroyed, and, and, and hundreds of thousands of people wiped out, Jews killed. Jesus is saying, in that day, having a kid would be terrible because your kid's going to starve, your kid's going to die at the edge of a Roman sword. It's going to be awful. Be better not to be pregnant. Be better not to have children in those days. Jesus, don't weep for me. Weep for yourself. A very dark day is coming. But Jesus isn't just simply referring to the dark day that was coming for Jerusalem in AD 70. He was speaking of a future judgment, of the final judgment. He quotes Hosea chapter 10. And Hosea chapter 10 is quoted in the Apostle John's writing in Revelation chapter 6, verse 16, in which he says this is what that final judgment will look like. They will call to the mountains and the rocks, and they will say, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. In other words, the judgment that was coming for Jerusalem was going to be awful. be better never to have kids, because you wouldn't want to see him go through AD 70 and the torment that's going to come with that. But also there's a future judgment that's coming that's going to be so awful that people would rather have an avalanche fall on them than to see the one who's sitting on the throne. Because when he comes, he's not coming to be warm and fuzzy. He's coming as a judge. And those who are against him won't want to see the fierce nature of the one who is coming sitting on a throne. Now perhaps this side of Christianity bothers you. Right now you're already bothered. Oh, here they go. Crazy, crazy people talking about judgment and an angry God and wrath and oh I hate that side of Christianity I don't even know if it's true I believe in a God of love and a, a God of, of mercy and grace and and not a God of wrath and anger I believe in a God of love and grace and mercy but the Bible also presents the side of God which is going to come in judgment and that's the side of, of Christianity that we don't like to talk about so much because it's so uncomfortable right and and it really doesn't fly in the world that we live in the world we live in man it's politically correct you can't judge anybody for anything at any time or you are a hater so you better not be hating on anybody it doesn't matter what their worldview is anything goes moral relativism man it pervades the cultural air that we breathe so, so, so to be a bigoted, judgmental hater, man, I don't even want to identify with that. I don't want to talk about judgment. I was listening to, uh, to Dr. Kim, Timothy Keller on this as he was talking about how Christians navigate through the side of Christianity that's difficult, and that is the side where God is actually wrathful and angry. And, and he used the analogy of the way an ecosystem works. You know the ecosystem, the way, the way that nature works together in balance? And he said that, that this side of God is like the way the ecosystem works because there are certain things in any ecosystem that are kind of like the beasts or the creatures that you don't like. You know, the shark of North Carolina, right? What are we at? Number seven now, right? And I'm taking my kids to the beach next week. Like, well, I don't know if we're going in the water, right? Shark attack everywhere. But there's, there's that one creature in the ecosystem. You're like, oh no, like I wish that God just never made that. But see, the way the ecosystem works is if you want to have the beauty, there also must be the other side that you think is not so beautiful. Like my son Silas was telling me, because he reads animal books like crazy. He's like always in animal encyclopedia. 
So anything you want to know about animals, ask Silas. He's fun to go to the zoo with because he's like a tour guide, right? He's like, did you know this about that and that and that? And I'm like, whoa, man. Um, so he, he said, I said, Silas, tell me about ecosystems. And he goes, oh, dad, there's a great story for you. In Bolivia, in Bolivia, there was a situation where the, the hunters were out taking tourists in Bolivia to hunt the, was it the black caiman, right? That looks like a crocodile, right? And, and for sport, they were hunting the black caiman and the population of the black caiman went way down, almost to, to extinction in Bolivia. But, but there was a problem because they had eliminated, they were eliminating the black caiman and while that was happening, every animal that the black caiman would feed on started to rise, like the capybara and the piranha. And that was trouble for the local farmers because the capybaras were eating all the, 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 the crops. As they were, no, no black caimans to eat them. Man, they were just eating all the farmers' crops. And the piranhas were eating the cattle. Right? So big problem. Ecosystem out of balance. Oh, let's get rid of the black caiman of the kingdom. I don't want that. And Timothy Keller uh, uh, then reemphasizes that the kingdom of God has its own ecosystem. That is... You can't just say, I want to believe in a God of love and mercy and not believe that God is actually angry over the stuff that's going on on planet Earth. Can you have your eyes open? Someone should be angry about that stuff. And his, his anger is righteous. And so we want the beauty and the mercy and the love of the kingdom. And so do I. I love preaching the love and mercy and grace of God. You can't get that side of the ecosystem without the, the hard fact that God is righteously indignant towards the sin of those who trample on others. There is evil in the world and there is a righteous judge who is going to put his foot down and say, not on my watch anymore. Things are going to be made right, but not without the anger of God. And Jesus is informing these who are sentimental. Oh, it's the, the, the weeping side of... Oh, Jesus, Jesus, don't weep for me. You weep for yourself. You don't get it. The days are going to get dark. You need to repent. God is coming. I'm here now as the sacrificial lamb, Jesus could say, but I'm not coming back this way. You know he doesn't come back the way he came the first time. You only get gentle Jesus, meek and mild once. Have you read Revelation chapter 1? We have feet like brass, like that just came out of a furnace, smoke coming out, eyes like fire, hair white like wool. I mean, he's warrior Jesus now, a golden sash, a tattoo on his thigh that says King of Kings and Lord of Lords. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm worshiping. That's not gentle Jesus, meek and mild. But I love the whole ecosystem of the kingdom. It keeps things in balance. Do I understand how it works? Absolutely not. Just as much as I don't understand our ecosystem that God has put in place, like why do we have mosquitoes, right? Why do we have the little critters that bite and sting? Why do we have poison oak? And some would say that's the fall of man. I agree. But the ecosystem works on itself. So too in the kingdom of God. And the sentimentality that these women had was being corrected by Jesus. Judgment is going to be meted out because evil must be judged if God is to be called righteous. Verse 32, we see yet another reaction. And this is the, the famed reaction of the two criminals. Verse 32, two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. This shows the work of Jesus from the cross right here. He's forgiving while he's dying. That's the point of the cross, to forgive people who are ignorantly doing things against him. They, the soldiers, divided up his clothes by casting lots. They were gambling for his clothes, playing games. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers, verse 36, also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and, and said this, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. It's the second time they've said that. If you are who you say you are, show off, do something, save yourself, get off this cross. And there was written a notice above him, verse 38, which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. And I'm thinking, get an original statement here, pal. Hasn't everybody said this to Jesus? Do something about this cross. 
But the other criminal weighs in. And he rebuked this man. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, said, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So two criminals are on the right and left of Jesus. One is repentant and one is unrepentant. That is the, the, the fifth reaction, uh, and that is the reaction of the two criminals, repentant and unrepentant. The first criminal starts insulting Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself, but also he noticed, save yourself and save us. Like, I want off this cross too. So if you're really God, show that you're really God by ending my suffering. Have you ever been in a season of your life where you've said this? God, if you are who you say you are, then heal my mother of cancer. If you are who you say you are, heal me of this disease. Take care of my financial bind. In other words, I will believe in you if you do what I say. I'm on this cross, and so are you. I don't want this suffering, so you take care of this, and then we can strike up a deal, and I'll believe who you are. But if you don't do what I'm asking you to do and take care of my suffering, then I'm not going to believe in you. How many people do we know have abandoned ship in Christianity because they said, somebody I love died untimely. How could a good God allow this? But you know, Jesus doesn't respond to this man's request. Because this man didn't know what he was asking. He was saying, Jesus, get yourself off this cross. For Jesus to come off the cross is the very thing that was about to save the world. You don't want Jesus to come off the cross. He comes off the cross, no one lives eternally. But all this man could see was get us out of this temporal suffering. Because his life was only lived in what he could see and feel and touch. And so he would believe in a God who would do him good always, but the minute God would let him die, God would let suffering continue in his life, nope, I'm not going to believe in you. So many people are in that condition. God help us. God help us to trust him even when we're being crucified. Even when the worst is happening. The second criminal, he has like sort of a mini revival and awakening happening because he realizes two things. I'm justly dying. I deserve what I'm getting and he's the king of the universe. He realizes though, those are the most two important truths that you're ever going to realize. Number one, that you deserve whatever suffering comes your way and that he's the king of the universe. And at that, he says to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Everyone else is saying, if you're a king, then show us. He's saying, I know he's a king and he's about to inherit his kingdom. I just want you to remember me. How did he know that? Only by the Spirit was he awakened. To know that there was hope for the man being crucified right next to him. Christianity isn't easy to believe. I'm just going to say that. I think it's the most believable and plausible, and there's all kinds of reasons for it, but it isn't easy to believe. Sometimes when I explain it to people, I think I'm crazy. <laughs> 2,000 years ago, there was a Jewish man who only reached a small circle of people. He was crucified on a Roman cross, and a lot of criminals were in that day. He was crucified, and when he was crucified, he was God in the flesh. He took all my sin away, and then he rose again on the third day. He's in heaven now, and he's going to come back for me. I'm like, that just sounds nuts. <laughs> Did I really just say that? That's the news I believe. Why do I believe that? Why am I not like the other criminals? Like, you know what? I mean, you could show yourself to me, like, I mean, really, like, if you really want me to believe in you, like, be more believable. Do something that would say, I'm God. Like, you could, like, part the heavens and just one time speak to the whole world all at once. Just shout at us. Guess what? We wouldn't follow him anyway. He's done those things in the past. Look at Israel. Look at their unbelief. And look at all the things. God parted seas for them. He spoke from mountains and thunder and lightning. God's audible voice has been known before. People still didn't trust him. The point is, is this man was willing to deal with the fact that I deserve to be here, he doesn't, and I believe he's going to his kingdom. And Jesus says to that man, that's enough. You realize you're a sinner and I'm Savior. Today you'll be with me in paradise. That's it. 
That's it. Thief on the cross. I know I deserve to be here. You don't. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. I know you're inheriting a kingdom. I know you're the king of the universe. I believe and I trust you even though it doesn't look like you're winning right now. Even though it doesn't look like Christianity is the most popular worldview right now. I still believe in the man who hangs on the cross. I still believe that he is the answer to the world's problems. It may sound ridiculous to people that don't believe, but I am stupid enough or faith-filled enough in the eyes of everybody else to say, I still believe in the crucified Jesus. I still believe that if I would say, I deserve wrath, but thank you for saving me, and I want to be in your kingdom with you because I realize you're the king. He says, that's enough. You get to come in to be with me forever. This thief, the repentant one, saw the cross as a doorway into the kingdom. And then we finish with this, finally. Verse 44. It was now about noon. Darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. The sun stopped shining. The curtain of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. Mark's gospel says in Mark 15, 39, the centurion said, Certainly, surely this was the Son of God. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. I want to end with this. The day that Jesus died, nature revolted against man who were killing its maker. You read the other gospel accounts, it's radical what happens the day that Jesus dies. Luke tells us from noon to three, it went dark. The sun stopped shining. The sun revolted against humanity and it went dark all over the land. Matthew's gospel tells us the earth shook. Rocks were ripped. Not broken, ripped a powerful force had been unleashed on the universe. Graves were opened and faithful men and women who had been dead came back to life and went and started talking to people. The zombie apocalypse happened the day that Jesus died. The day that Jesus died, the universe revolted against man who was killing its maker. And the Bible says, that the veil in the temple ripped from the top to the bottom. Now that's no small feat. I don't know if you know anything about this veil. It was 30 feet high, 60 feet wide, three over three inches thick, and it weighed about four tons. The Talmud tells us it took 300 priests to carry the veil. And the day Jesus died, that veil went whoosh, like a piece of notebook paper like Kleenex, the day that Jesus died. Because a force had been released on the world. You killed your maker, and he is dying for you. And now what's happening is that veil that used to keep people away from God that represented separateness is now been completely obliterated, and you can come right into the presence of God. There is nothing keeping you from God anymore because Jesus' body was ripped, the veil was ripped, and now the way has been opened. Something tremendous happened the day that Jesus died. It wasn't a defeat, and you know that because you know it's coming, right? It might be Friday, but Sunday's coming. That old preacher said, Friday was the day of victory. Christus victor. He cried out from the cross, it is finished, or is actually in the Greek one word, finished, finito, victory, in your face, slam dunk, oh yeah. <laughs> Jesus won the day on the day that it looked like he lost. The day that Jesus died. And the centurion is the final response. He said, this was a righteous man. Or surely this was the Son of God. And it says he praised God. I would have loved to be there the day that after Jesus was killed, a centurion, a Roman centurion, praised God and said, that's the Son of God. 
That, my friends, is the way I want to respond to the crucified Jesus. It's called being worshipfully persuaded. Persuaded my mind, worship my heart, bring the two together. It's a hands or it's a head and heart belief system. Persuaded in my mind, moved in my heart. Oh God, praise your name for crucified Jesus. And I'm persuaded this is the Son of God. I will follow him all of my days. I believe in him. Where are you? as it concerns the crucified Jesus. Avoiding him for how long? Curious about him? He's not going to respond to that. Hating him? He can overcome that. Sentimental? Where are you? I pray that we would all be in the place of either criminal number two Or the centurion. I would suggest the centurion is the best place. A people who are worshipfully persuaded that just trust and believe in the crucified Lord. Amen.